But the top story is about something I've told you is going down, election month. People used to call it election day, but we are in a drastically different turnout model now. There's a slogan that says November 5th is not the start of the election, it is the end. That's a nod to early voting. And there are memes that tout early voting as really the fun, cool thing to do. It is the best way to get that feeling when you've early voted. The meme you see there is based on other popular do-it-yourself kind of internet jokes, but we can share that a city in Texas used that as a kind of nonpartisan plug to remind people early voting is a way to get your vote out. And for a lot of people, a more efficient way to get it done and wrapped up before Election Day. Voters also spreading the word to each other online. There are 19 days of early voting left. And we're now getting the first reports of how it's going. And so for all the back and forth between the campaigns, which we cover, the big clash with Harris and Brett Baer, which I told you is coming up, what you see on your screen are the results. Georgia has been breaking records with over 700,000 people already casting their ballot after waiting in line in that crucial state. Now, if you just take Georgia as one example, that is already over 15 percent of the state's entire turnout there last time, and that's already in a few days. Over in North Carolina, the lines to vote might just remind you of any typical election day. And both campaigns see North Carolina tightening, especially as Trump faces the risk of this controversial Republican as their party's nominee for governor. So who benefits more from early voting? Well, that's one of the big debates. Democrats think this is good for them if they can bank early votes and that higher turnout in some of these states has historically helped them. Republicans, though, we should remind you, have switched from Trump's 2020 attacks on mail and early voting to a much more balanced stance. Meanwhile, what you're seeing here is Kamala Harris really going all out. She's trying to protect the blue wall. Blue wall. She did three stops in Wisconsin already today, talking about getting Republican support from Trump's own former aides. Which is why Democrats and independents and Republicans are supporting our campaign. In fact, just yesterday, I was with over 100 Republican leaders from across the country who joined me on the campaign trail. was about putting country before party. And some of them served in Donald Trump's previous administration. The people who know him best. Harris doing rallies, town halls, TV interviews, that string of internet and digital appearances we've told you about. Now, Trump, for his part, is on the trail. It is the home stretch, but he's measurably less active. Rallies have been a mainstay for him, but he's actually doing far fewer of them this season than 2016. As you see there, so far, but still he's got, not going to get anywhere near that total number. It was in 16 when those 200-plus rallies powered that Electoral College win. He's canceled some of the only mainstream TV interviews he's agreed to, from 60 Minutes to CNBC. He's been posting online now about why he'd prefer to face Biden as his opponent, and he cited the 60 Minutes interview that he bailed on, which was now 10 days ago, as part of his reasoning. It's an odd reference at a minimum. But it's part of a larger pattern. Trump was mocked to start the week for that odd music episode on Monday, the dancing, the swaying. Nothing against DJing. If you watch this program at all, you know we could all appreciate music in so many ways. But it's not like he organized a musical event and then people came for it. He promised a town hall and then bailed on it and turned it into a little bit of what you see here. He skipped the promised Q&A. So when you stack it all up, you see the pattern. Trump running from anywhere that he has to face questions, sometimes agreeing to face questions on 60 Minutes or CNBC, which both said with evidence that he'd agreed before he bailed. Town Hall was a chance to take questions, but he canceled. So you have Trump. And what seems to help him more than anything is not necessarily how he's campaigning, but just this post-COVID inflation and economic set of jitters, which we've been reporting on. Now, those are factual and perception dynamics. They certainly dragged Biden down a lot. And they've led many voters in various ways to say they want change. And even if inflation is getting better, and we've reported on that, people are still struggling to make ends meet. And they have very recent negative memories of what they just lived through. So think about it like this. Donald Trump left office with a very low approval rating compared to most modern presidents. It cratered 
as you can see there, in the 30s, the average was a record low. That's not what you want to be as a president, and you know the guy follows ratings, a record low overall cumulative average of 41 percent. Now, you might say, gosh, how would he ever get back into the White House with those numbers? But here's why it is closer than some may think it should be. Voters basically misremember giving him higher marks. That retrospective that you see on the right is presidential job approval when people are asked, what did you think of that president's job approval? So the Biden number is current, and it's not that high either for reasons I just mentioned, but the Trump number is now higher than it ever was. So that's, if anything, a basically a memory error. Steve Kornacki has been reporting on it this week, a kind of longing for the things that people imagine were better than they were in the past. Now, the pop star Dua Lipa has explored the idea of future nostalgia, that you might want to drive backwards through the memories of your youth. Well, for Trump, the appeal here is a kind of political nostalgia. Voters, by the numbers I just showed you, thinking back on his time as president and remembering it not just as better or worse than we might argue it was on the facts, that's a debate, but overall people are remembering it as better than they said it was at the time. And it's more potent for conservatives, perhaps, who already lean into an entire ideology around conserving the past and being careful with anything new and different and progress in the future. And then the MAGA movement literally spells out the longing for a history when America was supposedly great, unlike now. So that's a dynamic here that is separate from everything I just told you about the campaigning and the rallies and the media. People, when asked misremember liking the Trump presidency more than before, the political nostalgia. So, as always, I'll tell you what's going on out there. That's something that's going on. I'll also compare it to what we know about the facts and the evidence, because the people who objectively study political history, who write the first draft, who live and shape it, they say Donald Trump's first term was more than a disaster, more than a low approval cratering, record low. They say it was, some of them, the most disqualifying presidential term ever, including Richard Nixon, the only president to be forced out of office. That is exactly what Watergate icon of veteran journalist Bob Woodward concluded. And he's extensively reported on every president from Nixon on. That includes, of course, Trump. It includes the Biden-Harris administration, which he documents in a new book. And here's exactly what he told us last night. The problem with Trump is uh, he was running for president and he thinks he's qualified. He's disqualified. Hmm. There is no one suited by temperament uh, as ill-equipped for the presidency. And you put somebody in there like Trump again after all he's learned or yeah. all he said he he's wants to do, he wants to settle scores. Settle scores, do vengeance, double down when Woodward says he's disqualified. Woodward's reporting has come up for both candidates this week. Harris quoting the fascist rebuke that is from Woodward's book from Trump's own general. And the list of Republicans for Harris, meanwhile, has been growing. That's what she's been campaigning on, citing today. The Cheneys, her show of force at that rally. We have one of the people who was up there tonight, by the way, shining a light on how Trump has control of his party, which is something very different from having the confidence or respect or even genuine agreement with members of the leadership of his party. And that brings us to this news, not a full-blown October surprise, but certainly not fun for the Trump campaign. Republican Mitch McConnell, it is now exposed in a new book, has privately called Trump Stupid, despicable, ill-tempered, not very smart, irascible, nasty, and a sleazeball. These were conversations after Trump's 2020 loss, and it contrasts how McConnell claims he supports Republican Trump in public. And I said I would support the nominee for president, even if it were the former president. I would support President Trump if he were the nominee of our party, and he obviously is going to be the nominee of our party. So that was a kind of word salad where he reiterated he'll just do whatever the party does, and that's that. 
First of all, it wasn't a very warm endorsement to begin with. But second of all, you see behind the mask now. The truth is, many warned against Trump before. They warned about it in 16. Party leaders from Mike Johnson, now Speaker, to Ted Cruz. And they just walk it back. So here's McConnell's explanation, because he had to respond to this news story tonight. Whatever I may have said about Trump, McConnell says, pales in comparison to what Vance, Graham, and others have said about him. And we're all on the same team now. Fact checked, true, on the hypocrisy, because what team are they on? People who spent decades in or trying to get into public life, full grown adults, sometimes at the end of their careers, who are ready to retract it all for their one way relationship with Donald Trump. It also ignores the red line of the insurrection. Graham famously said, count me out, and went back in. This is bigger than Jan 6th, and it's bigger than recent history, although the insurrection and that history underscores that even when they counted out, they came back. The Harris campaign isn't just benefiting from some Republican hugs and endorsements at the margins or a DNC speech here or there. In fact, you've seen some of these people, former Trump aides, pop up right here on this program and pop up at rallies with Harris and pop up on TV and in ads. We are in the home stretch, and Kamala Harris is betting that this is part of her closing argument, especially for people who are still learning about her or only tune in late, to say she can't be extreme if she has the Cheneys, and Donald Trump can't be a normal Republican with everything everyone's saying about him in his party, including his own aides.